Shalom. Welcome to the Way of Messiah Fellowship. We are a husband and wife team walking in the Hebraic roots of faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We desire to bring you teachings that are biblically based, not sensationally based, and we hope to make some sense out of some nonsense as well. Sound doctrine is what the body of Messiah needs at this hour to build us all up in faith, maturity, and unity. Thank you for joining us as we follow Yeshua, our Jewish Messiah and King. He is our greatest hope, our strength, peace, and joy in all areas of life on this short side of eternity. It's an exciting journey, digging deeper into Scripture to discover hidden gems that God longs for us to find. We look forward to hearing from you, so please feel free to give us a thumbs up or comment below. You can also send us an email at twmfellowship at gmail.com. Blessings and shalom, y'all, from our home to yours. So let's open with a word of prayer. Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, El Shaddai, God Almighty, we bless you, we magnify you. We love you. Yeshua, we appreciate you. We want you to know that we dedicate this time to you. May the words that we speak, the way that May the words that we study here today, may they glorify you in all things. Remind us, our Father, that we are never alone, that you would leave us or forsake us. Remind us that you are with us even when things look the darkest. And so as we move forward, we just ask you to, to inhabit this space here, inhabit the spaces of all those who are online with us, Make us aware of your presence. Father, as always, from this point forward, less of me and more of you, that you alone are glorified. We thank you for the privilege to gather together in this space. We ask you to bless the First Methodist Church who allows us to gather in this space. Bless their ministry. Once again, we bless you and magnify you. We thank you for everything that you've done for us, that you do for us today, and that you will do for us in the future. We place these petitions before you in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. So before we get our readings, we're going to look into our word of the week. You know, we have the word of the week every week. This is a chance to learn a little bit of Hebrew. So our word of the week may surprise you. Because our Torah portion this week, the name of the Torah portion is Bo, which means go. We're going to look at a different word of the week this week, which is this one, which is the word Oht, O-H-T, and that's what it is in the Hebrew. And Oht, is, you'll see it translated as sign or token, and that's a pretty accurate uh, assessment of what the word means, but it also means monument or evidence or a miracle, that would be considered a sign and boat of God's presence. And then I have this little sign that I'm just going to throw in for free. I'm not going to charge anything for it. Right there. But it needs something on it. So stop looking for signs. That's my that's my sign to you. Because we, y'all are new to this, those of us in the Messianic community usually spend a whole lot of time trying to find signs and symbols and where they don't exist. That, you know, how many letters are in this word? What does that mean? How many spaces are in the, in the Kabbalah studies? When they study the Torah, they literally look at the amount of space between the words as if that has some specific meaning. So they're as bad as we can get because we can get off out there in La La Land looking for symbols that don't exist so we can make something mean more than it does. Uh, hello, it's probably just me, but for my money, when I'm reading this, what it says is pretty powerful. And I don't really need to add anything to that. But this is kind of our theme. We're going down this road a little bit today for a little bit because it also has to be part of our Torah course. Ah, we just read part of it today, this week's. The word, the word parasha simply means portion. See, each week, uh, there's a portion of scripture that gets read traditionally. 
uh, among Jews and Messianics. The, the rabbis took the five books of motion, Moses, portions of the prophets, followers of Jesus, Yeshua, took portions of the apostolic writings or New Testament and set those aside each week so that through the course of a year, you work your way through the entire five books of Moses, the entire Torah. So there's a chunk of scripture that's read in the households every week. Carol and I, as I mentioned before, have done this, been doing this for two decades. So we've been through the Torah at least 20 times. Every time, every time we go through it, something new crops up. You would think after 20 times that you're ready to be like, yeah, okay, no, it's happening. Nope, because his word is fresh and new every day. And so the name of this Torah portion is Bo, which means go, which we would have read. Brad actually read that in verse 1. When Moses, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, go in to Pharaoh. That's where this Torah portion gets its, gets its name. In the Hebrew, you would see that word Bo, which means go there. So this week's Torah portion, part of what Brad read, is Exodus 10, 1 through chapter 13, verse 16. The Hoff Torah, which is the prophets, readings from the prophets, is Jeremiah 46, 13 through 28. The Sefer Shalakim, I don't ask Mike because he's not here, which means the writings of the apostles. Luke 22, 7 through 30, which we read part of, which was about is about that last Passover that Yeshua shared with his disciples. And then, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 11, which Jana read part of for us, is a familiar passage of scripture that everybody reads, every church reads it, whether it's every quarter or every week. Every church pulls out that portion of Paul's writings when they start to do communion, and they read about that. Somehow or another, we forget what Paul is instructing the people is about how to keep Passover, not how to do some new thing. So that's our Torah portion. We might get back to that. We might not. Let's look at our overview and see where, where we're kind of going. So the overview of everything that's in the Torah portion, these are all the little notes that I was able to make. Yes, John, there are a lot more, but you know the deal. We only have so much time. Being hard-hearted has no upside. None whatsoever. Just ask Pharaoh. He was hard-hearted, but it was not a good deal in it for him ever at all. The same is true for us. If we get hard-hearted, there's no upside to it. And we talked about this one week. We'll hit it again briefly. We read in scriptures, because our translations are really bad, all of them, I don't care which one you're reading unless you read the Hebrew, say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And we think that means that Pharaoh was a chess piece on God's big chess board, and God just made him do what he wanted him to do. When you understand the Hebrew word that's used for harden, which I don't know off the top of my head, it implies that Pharaoh had something to do to it also. Matter of fact, when you read through the entire ten plagues, you see that initially Pharaoh just didn't like Moses coming in there and and telling him what to do, and Pharaoh just simply got mad. Well, later on, Pharaoh just got really mad. So Pharaoh, in effect, decided his heart was going to be hard toward the Hebrews because he didn't like Moses showing up and saying, let these folks go. So after a certain point, Pharaoh's heart was so hard that God could use him the way he wanted to. But uh, the truth of the matter is, is that God gave him every opportunity to repent and turn the Hebrew people loose. But at every turn, Pharaoh decided, nope, get you, I'm in charge, and I'm not going to do what you said. So there. And God just used that and went, okay, fine. You can just keep that attitude. I'm going to deal with you. And he did. So hard-heartedness, us being hard-hearted to more people today, same deal. Has no, there's no upside to it at all. We might feel good for a minute. Aha, uh -huh. I got it. We got one over on you somehow, Diane, because I got mad at you. How does that hurt her? Not at all. 
who does it hurt? Me. And I'm the one that made that decision. So again, no upside. Okay. So then we'll read, there's two more plagues. Locust and darkness are what's in this one. And there was light in the darkness. We're going to look at that. And then there's the riches of the wicked. Remember, God had, had the Hebrews go in and spoil the, Egypt, the Egyptians. We're reading this Torah portion where God gave them favor. And they went and, King James says, they went and borrowed gold and silver and riches and all that kind of stuff. They didn't borrow it. The Egyptians couldn't give it to them fast enough. It was like, take this and get out of here. But I submit, there's this rabbi I like to listen to. Well, we'll, we'll cover this in a little bit. So then there's one more plague, and we know what that one was. That was the death of the firstborn. And then we have God telling the people, when I see the blood. We know that account. We're going to look into it a little bit deeper. And then there's the Passover and the beginning of a new year. Actually, it's not the beginning of a new year. It's the establishing of a new year. At the time of the Passover is when God said, this month will be for you the beginning of your months or the beginning of your year. Newsflash, it wasn't January. It was, for us, would have been April, March, April. It was the Hebrew month of Abib, sometimes known as Nisan. And then we have redeeming the firstborn, which we could spend all afternoon on. And in our Haftorah portions, my mouse was going stupid. Egypt will never rise again. John read part of that. The end result is that God told Egypt, you will never again rise to the power they were when you subjected my people to bondage. And if you've ever been to Egypt, you know that that's true. Because even though it's considered a a more cultured Arab nation, it's still third world. Brett? Am I correct that the Israelites probably built the pyramids and those other structures? Of course they did. They were the backbone. They were the, they were the labor. But it wasn't just the Hebrews that did that. If, if we read, we won't get to it this week, but if you're reading your Torah portion, do we have Torah portion cards over there? Mm, yeah, we do. So maybe, Brad, did you might want to grab one? You can start reading the Torah portions each week. Next week's Torah portion talks about how when Israel left Egypt, it wasn't just the Israelites. It was a mixed multitude, which means that there were other folks that were there, too. Remember, Egypt at the time, the Pharaoh was basically the ruler of the entire known world. And when we read about the plague that took place, basically everybody in the world, the known world at the time, in, that, in the Mediterranean basin, went to Egypt to get bread because they didn't have any more left, and they ended up selling their land, their livestock, and ultimately themselves. It wasn't just the Hebrews that happened with them. So that when we see them come out, it's a mixed multitude that comes out. I will never forget when I went through the Suez Canal on active duty, that the land is just desolate. I mean, it's just this great big dirt box. I mean, it's just desolate. And we read about it. The, like the, uh, the wonders of the ancient world. One of them was some of the gardens that were in Egypt. And I looked at the land and I thought, how in that world can that be? Because there's just, there's nothing there. So anyway, God's word, he is true to his word, just like we did the blessing about it. So the apostolic writings, remember, New Testament, the apostolic writings, it was the apostles that wrote those words, okay? was Yeshua's last Passover, what we just read about, and then Paul's instructions concerning Passover conduct. Again, what we see in 1 Corinthians is not some new deal. Paul was expecting these folks to behave themselves, and that's what he was giving up the country about. Some of you eat, you stop and you eat before you show up over here. Some of you are just drunk when you show up. The whole purpose of getting together was to break bread together in keeping the Passover biblical feast, because in that Passover feast included the bread that Yeshua picked up and broke 
and said, this is my body. That cup he picked up and said, this is the cup of the New Testament. Was It was all part of the Passover Seder. Speaking of which, because we're closing in on that time of the year, this is a good time to be thinking about Passover. Yeah. Because it will be here before you know it. We are hoping to do a Passover Seder. Stand by, more information to come. Uh, we don't know where yet, but we have every intention of not doing one virtually this year like we did last year, but being able to gather and actually have the Passover celebration in, in, in obedience to the command. So that's our that was our overview. We want to start with the aspect of light in the darkness. So Exodus 10 verses 21 to 23, and if you if you've got that application, it'll actually be there on your phone in front of you. Then Adonai said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. Now you see this phrase frequently, land of Egypt. That's where you have to put it into context. Sometimes it will mean that entire basin. Sometimes it'll only mean the land where Pharaoh lived. And scripture will be very specific about that. Verse 22, so Moses, well, back up to verse 21, you see uh, God tells Moses, this is going to be a darkness that will be felt. Such a heavy darkness, you literally can feel it. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was a pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from their place for three days. But, I like this part. But all the people of Israel had light where they lived. So God drew a line between Goshen and Egypt. And maybe it looks something like this. I don't know. I mean, this is just a big, it's a cloud of smoke is what this is. But you can see that there's one area that's not covered up and one area that is. I would have loved to have seen that because there had to be at some point, there had to be just this line. It's like this dark there, and it's not dark here, which must have been an awesome thing to see. Once again, we, what we just read, Adonai placed a distinction between Israel and the nations, or in other words, those who were not part of the covenant. Did you know he's done the same thing with us today? He places a distinction between those who are his and those who are not. And if we live like those who are not, then we're not being true to the distinction that God placed on us. This was no solar eclipse. There have been individuals, yeah. of individuals, who said, no, no, this, is not. this was a big, huge solar eclipse. Okay, well, if you've ever seen a solar eclipse, it doesn't get so dark you can't see anything. It's dark. It doesn't get that dark. I mean, it does, sometimes it doesn't even get nighttime dark. This was not only a direct attack on the sun god, the Egyptian sun god, which was the last god next to Pharaoh. This was an attack on that god. Basically, it was the god of the Israels, Israelites saying just exactly whose god is God here. Because at this point, Pharaoh's Above us couldn't produce this. They'd already reached that point in the plagues where they couldn't, they were already telling him, look, look, doc, we gotta let these people go because this is the finger of God. And we can't fight this. Remember, they were able to make their staffs into snakes, they were able to make the fleas, the, the you know, the vermin come up, they were able to make the frogs appear, all that. But then there was that point when Moses went out and struck the ground. And the dust became boils. The Egyptian magicians were like, I, we can't do that. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So this was that line that was being specifically drawn. We need to understand this, when I found this when I was researching, this was a terrifying supernatural darkness, the type of darkness which can be felt in which no light and even fire would pierce. No being could see one another for three days. 
for three days. Think about that. All life was withdrawn from Egypt. Have you ever been in any of these caves? You know, there's Carlsbad caverns and all these different caves and stuff. And when you get down there, the first thing they always want to do is they want to show you what it means to have pitch black. And they turn out the light system in those caves. And it's, wow. You, I mean, you literally cannot. It's that, it is that darkness that's, that you can, it's like tangible. It's creepy. Yeah, you can almost feel it. So that's, here's the thing though, that's a natural occurrence. That's just a natural occurrence. This was God's darkness. This is where the king of the universe just went and literally pulled all the light out of the land. And there's a similar to, I mean, there's a, there's a, so what are you looking for, John? There's a, there's a comparison to be made here. These people in Egypt experienced what it would be like without any light at all. I submit to you that the disciples of Yeshua he was in the tomb for three days, suddenly understood what it meant to be without light, to have their light withdrawn for three days. Because they followed him. They knew he was Messiah. There was not a doubt in their mind. This is the guy right here. And then for him to be gone for three days, I'm sure that they were, they were in terror. They were petrified. What's going to happen next? So God draws this distinction between Goshen, people of Israel, and Egypt, like he does for us today. Just because, this is a point on this whole thing, there's light in Goshen doesn't mean it was easy. Yeah, God separated them. He said he'd identified that these are mine, and you are not. But at this point, they're still under bondage. Life is still tough for them. They don't have it easy. By now, Israel themselves knew that they were different. They realized because they'd been, remember, 430 years now, they've been in bondage. They remember what Jacob, their father, Reuben, and the others, all his sons, had told them about how God had promised that there would be a deliverer, that they would be in bondage, but that God would bring them out. They'd been told all that by the by the fourth plague, when God drew that distinction, when the hail came and killed all the animals in Egypt, and nothing happened to their animals, nothing happened to their crops, they understood that they were different. God saw them as different from everyone else. Not only that, but everyone else saw that they were different. By this point, when that line is drawn, the other folks, remember those other nations we're talking about? Those other nations would have been looking at Israel and going, what? well, those folks really are different. I, Brad, I think I want what they've got going on over there. So they would have already been looking at all that. This, the idea that the God who they really didn't know at this point, they knew that he existed, Jacob had told them about that. He, he was and is now. They had identified him as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They knew him as their God, but they didn't know him. But even in the not knowing him, they still had this supernatural hope because they'd seen these things taking place. It gave them a level of encouragement that let them move to the next step. Whatever that next step was going to be, it was like they were ready. We're, okay, we, we know that God is with us, and we're ready to go to that next step. And then we read, Adonai said, when I see the blood, Exodus 12, verses 12 and 13, let's spend a little time here, and I've got a question for you. Mr. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down every firstborn. Notice he says, every firstborn. 
both men and animals, and I will execute judgments against all the gods of Egypt. I am Adonai for y'all's benefit. When you hear me say the word Adonai, when you hear us use the word Adonai, that is known as, now here's a, here's a good, here's a great scrabble word if you can get all the letters together. It's called a circumlocution. And it's a word that you use instead of another word. This is Hebrew. What's that? It's the same as Lord. It is actually the Hebrew word which means my Lord or my master. And the reason that it's used is in the place of God's ineffable name, like his covenant name. It's in which, and we're not afraid to use his name, which is Yahweh, as we, and then remember, Yahweh is, that's like, that's how we pronounce it, because that's what we understand. The bottom line is, is that nobody knows how to pronounce it. I need to say that again. There's going to be somebody out there that's going to go, well, I do. No, you don't. Nobody knows how to pronounce it, because God in his mercy saw to it that that name, that his covenant name, was lost to antiquity. Why? Because it's the covenant name of the creator of the universe. But he gave us another name. But we know the consonants. We do know the consonants. We do just don't know the vowels. You're right. Hey, Bobby. Right. You don't hey, Bobby. A lot of folks say like that. I think Bill Cloud, I think, does Yeah, he he, do hey, Bobby. It just uses the consonants. Yeah. Yeah. But he gave us another name. That's the, the point here is, is that if we knew his name, we would idolize that name. Which is wrong, not to make an idol out of anything. Not his name, not his likeness, nothing. And he gave us another name, and that name is Yeshua. Which means salvation. salvation. And he uses it throughout the Torah. He uses, you know, if you could read Hebrew, if you could spend some time in the Hebrew text, you'd see the word Yod Shin Bav Ayin. You'd see this word throughout the Hebrew text, which means salvation. It was changed when he was given to him as a name, meaning he is salvation, or he, Yeshua, is salvation. Or his salvation. So the other name that he gave us, Paul made it very clear, there's no other name under heaven and earth by which men may be saved, except for the name of Yeshua. Yeshua himself said, no man comes to the Father except how? By him. That's it. So God in his mercy, I'm down at Rabbi Trail, God in his mercy has hidden his name. One day we'll hear it again, and we'll know when we hear it. But so anyway, that's why you see, you'll hear us use the word Adonai. You will see it sometimes in the text because some of the translations that I use may have the name written in it. And out of respect for the name, I'll just insert Adonai. And the, and the Jewish people print Adonai, so they it's do. not misused. They so actually never use as a curse word like we have today. Right. They actually, uh, and we may do that one of these weeks we have spend time doing that sometime. When you see, when they see, uh, if I were to open the Torah scroll and show you where the name is mentioned, you'll see that the, the vowel points that are there are the vowel points that are used for Adonai. They're not the vowel points for the pronunciation of the name. They're the vowel points to remind us when we see that to use Adonai. Brad, we got one. In our English, the word Lord, does that come from that Adonai? When you see Lord in all caps, yes. every place you see it in all caps, that means that in the Hebrew, that's where you would find his Yod name. Yud Hey Bafe. That's where you find his name in the Hebrew. When you see Lord, capital L O R D, that is the Hebrew word Adonai or Adon, which means master. Okay? So, when, and I don't have a problem using the word Lord. So there's some groups that do. I don't, it's not pagan. It's not, none of that. You know, lighten up, take a breath. I just prefer to use Adonai because 
I want to imitate my king. So he goes on. He says, the blood will be a sign for you. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. Now it goes on and says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So there will be no plague among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is how we know that this plague was coming for everybody. Because Israel was in Goshen. If this was another one of those cases where God was going to draw the line, he wouldn't have told them to put blood on the doorpost because it would have, he would have drawn the line. He just said, I'm just going after them. He had to tell them to protect themselves because he's coming after everybody. And what we see here is that first point of faith in the salvation of Adonai through the blood. And how that the people were responsible to do a certain thing. In order for them to see his redemption, they had to put blood on the doorpost on the lentils of their house. If they chose, it was their choice. If they chose not to, their bones are still in Egypt. Simple as that. If they chose to, they came walking out. There's an application there for us. <laughs> And let me just encapsulate it so we can move on by simply saying that we, we, and those who study with us, are not interested in religion. We're interested in relationship. Because the whole thing about putting blood on the doorpost, putting blood, you hear it said, putting blood on the doorpost of our heart, that's a relationship. That's a covenant deal going on there. That's not rituals and actions. That's relationship with the king of the universe. Let me move on before I get lost in that. The blood will be a sign. Remember our Hebrew word? Ot. This is that word. The blood will be a sign. Is it a signpost? No. Is it a miracle? Well, Kind of depends on how you draw that connection. Is it a monument? Hmm. Perhaps. Could it be a token? Well, in this case, I would say that it would represent this our English word sign, the Hebrew word oath, would represent a token. Because when they slaughter the Passover lamb, they're taking some of that blood, a token, and they're putting that, applying that. To their door. Why? So that they will be redeemed from the bondage of Egypt. By the way, side note, won't charge you for this. The Hebrew word for Egypt is Mitzray. I should have put it on the slide. I did. Let me give that to you. How you spell this in English in case you want to write this down. It will be M-I-T-Z R-A-Y-I-M. That's M-I-T-Z Y-A-R-I-M. Mitzrayim. It means, did I spell that right? R-A-Y-I-M. M-I-T-Z R-A-Y-I-M. That's it. Mitzrayim. It certainly means Egypt. I mean, even the Scholars understand it means Egypt. However, the beauty is the beauty of the Hebrew, the Hebrew language. In English, I'm going to talk you through this. I wish I had done this on a slide. Maybe some other time. In English, the mem, the, the mi, the mi, that syllable mi. In the Hebrew, if you could look at that, it's a single, that's a single letter. And it's simply a preposition. It means from. Which, remember when we broke apart our Hebrew before, and we're going to break apart some Hebrew here. We broke apart our our, our verses that time, the, the, like Vayahi and Vayira, those things. Now you had those different letters in there. The M in, in Mitzrayim is like that. In Hebrew, it's just a letter. It means from. Okay, from, well, from what? We go to the other end of the word. We're still dealing with Mitzrayim. That the Y-I-M on the other end simply means it's a plural. 
Absolutely. So whatever whatever the thing is that we're from, there are many of them. And what's left in the middle, which would be the the T Z R. That one you can you can make that the Hebrew word T Z R. And in Hebrew it would be pronounced Sarah. You'd have to add like a little A-H on the end of it there in order, in order to get the Hebrew sound. The Hebrew word, Sarah, means, ready for this? It means bondage, punishment. To, to be bound up, it means to be bound over. It means uh, to be confined. It means all those things. So the, the name that the Hebrews had for the land that they were in means from bondages, from punishments, from whatever bad things that were happening to them. Did you know that we were in Mitzrayim ourselves? I was just going to say that. I was just going to say You were in we Mitzrayim at one time. We walked out this door. We're in Egypt. Before you came to know Yeshua Messiah? You were in Mitzrayim. You were in Egypt. You were in a land of bondage. You were, You think you're your own person? <clears throat> Not. Remember the AT&T commercials? I'm telling them myself. Years ago, there used to be a thing called long distance service. <laughs> <laughs> and it used to be owned by Ma Bell, period. And you could pick your long distance Per mile. And there was a commercial that says, if you don't make a choice, a choice will be made for you. Well, when we were born, not born again, but when we were born, we didn't have a choice. We were already, after we reached a certain age, we were already in the camp of bondage. We were never, ever our own person. Never. I don't care if you were. My brother John went to college, got a degree, multiple degrees. He didn't do that on his own. I don't know if he knew the Lord when all that was going on. If he didn't, he probably thought he was his own man making his own decisions. Nah, but thanks for playing. When I first joined the Marine Corps and started working up the ranks, and I thought I was it, buddy. I'm making all these decisions for myself, and I'm and I'm successful. <clears throat> wrong but thanks for playing we have never been our own person once we become children of the master once we become children of the covenant we're still not our own person because we've been bought with a price but now the one who leads and guides us has only our blessing in mind never our destruction so, oh, I got off down that one too. That, that's all just about the, the word Egypt. So he came to strike the land of Egypt. He came to take them out of the land of Egypt. The blood will be a sign for who? We're going to go. Here we go. When I see the blood. Question. Was the blood on the inside or the outside of the door? Huh? Outside. Okay. What do y'all think? Was on the left or inside? Side? Mike says inside. Oh, that's a good Brad says outside. What do you think? Outside. 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 Janice says the outside. Janice says the outside. Probably. You wouldn't want to see it when you leave it after you've already killed everybody. So. Right. So we assume it was on the outside of the door. I do too. Yeah. Why? Because we don't believe that God can see anything that's inside. Oh, that's good. We forget. This is the king of the universe. What? I put a wall up and all of a sudden he can't get in there and see what's going on? <laughs> nice try. Nope. But, I mean, outside is still, I mean, we're going we're gonna to go through, through this thing. Outside is still kind of where I land, but... We're going to talk about something that makes a lot of sense. You, you guys, you remember this guy, Rashi? 
We've talked about him before. We've referred to some of his teachings before. This, this guy is called Rashi, R-A-S-H-I. He's a Jewish sage who lived in the first century. His actual name was Rabbi Shlomo Yitzhaki. And that's how he got Rashi. It's just that that was that's what that's what the Jewish people do to this for the sages. They they kind of compress their name, identify them as a as a rebbe, which means a rabbi of rabbis, and then they just kind of use parts of their name. In his case, Rashi means rabbi or rebbe Shlomo Yitzhaki. He was a very astute individual. Most of the Jewish sages and scholars today look back at Rashi's writings to see what, well, let's go see what Rashi says, because he has that much influence. People respect his opinions that much. He reasoned that the door, that the blood was on the inside also, and I'm going to show you how. Ready for some more Hebrew? Good. Here we go. And the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. I will see the blood. We don't know how. We just know he said he would see the blood. And I will pass over you. We have to stop here. We're used to the idea of seeing the, the Passover, the understanding of the Passover of, of the angel of death. God says in this pace, I will pass over. All right, wait a second. He's going to send a plague or the angel of death kill off the firstborn, but then he says, I will pass over when God's not the one that's doing the killing. Have you ever thought that through? Huh? Sorry. The Lord God comes before the angel. Well, of course he comes before the angel, but he's not going to leave because if he leaves and he's not there, then the angel comes through and it's over. The word that we have here that's translated as pass over you, it implies actually hover over. It's the same concept that's used in Genesis 1 in the creation story when we see that the, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. It's like hovering. It's like a, like a, you ever seen a brood hen? And she's got her chicks all around and she hovers, she flaps her wings and she hovers over them and she takes very good care of them. That's the idea of what was going on with the Spirit of God in the creation story. It's generally the same idea here about him hovering over the houses. So, so picture this. First of all, the adversary is not God's hitman, so he doesn't sick the devil on you. And he didn't sick the angel of death on the people of Egypt because he had restrained the angel of death. In this case, basically, he just went, go ahead. Remember the book of Job? The devil comes before God. God says, where you been? Not just wandering around. God brags on Job. Job says, of course you're bragging on me. I mean, look at it. And remember, God laid out very specific lines that the devil could not cross when it came to dealing with Job. When it came to this plague that was going through Egypt, God laid out very specific lines. You can only go after the firstborn, but you can go after all the firstborn. So when we see God talking about, I will pass over you, think of it this way. God goes to a house that has the blood on the door somewhere. We're going to talk about that. We haven't lost our place. And instead of walking by, God, who is omnipresent, means he's everywhere all at once, takes that house and simply hovers. So that when the death angel comes by, God goes, you wait. These are mine. Go on, you wait. Psalm 91. Let's get it. Those who abide in the secret place of the Most High will dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. And you read Psalm 91, and that's just God hovering. 
And there says, no, no plague come near your dwelling. You won't, Mike, you won't stub your foot, according to Psalm 91. So that's what's going on here with the Passover thing. I didn't lose my place. We're still going to look at, and the blood will be a sign, oat, for you. This is how Rashi gets that, that inside thing. And it's, it's all in the Hebrew. Once again, we don't get it when we see the English. This is, this is the Hebrew. You want to read that for us, John? Close the blood will be assigned to you. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> this is the way that this verse is written in Hebrew. For those that are taking notes, it's Vahayah Hadam Lechem Laot. This is, as John pointed out, this is the sign for you. Vahayah Hadam Lechem Laot. And it's this word that we're going to focus on. John called it correctly. And it will be to you, the blood will be to you. Remember Hebrews kind of got this topsy-turvy approach to it. So something has to happen before you can tell what it is that's going to be. Okay, so vahaya means, and it will be. And it, it, will, it shall be. Okay, so we don't know what it is until we get to the next word. The next word gives us the subject. And it... The blood in this case, Hadam, the blood, it will be to you a sign. Rashi said that this word right here would be a plural. Now let's strip it away like we've done before. The first letter is called, it's the Hebrew letter Lamed, okay? And that's a preposition, it means to, for, or of. So we can strip that out of the way. And we're left with this word, Chem. That word is, in grammatical parlance, is second person plural. So it could be you. Not only that, though, just the fact that it's a plural noun, and it's plugged it back into place here. Again, when I read Hebrew, I have to read Hebrew as one who doesn't, wasn't raised reading Hebrew. So I'm doing the best I can. Folks like Rashi, and those rabbis that live in Israel today, they're ready, they read Hebrew like we read English. Okay, so they understand all the nuances for the different words. Rashi saw this verse as being, and the blood would be assigned for them, which is also plural. So it's still a plural noun, but Rashi saw it as it'll be a sign for them instead of a sign for you. Well, if I said it's going to be a sign for them. It's going to be a sign for you. How is it going to be a sign for you if you're in the house and it's outside? I'm only just asking. To, well, only to the extent that you put it there. Only to the extent, right, only to the extent you, you put it there. But it's not like you're standing outside. Well, right. I mean, the assumption Looking is that, you know, the fact that you're inside doesn't mean it went away just because you couldn't see it. I mean, it's like a, it's not a two-year-old playing hide and seek. It still exists, <laughs> right? Right. So I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So again, you know, we have outside, we have inside. We don't know. But again, the whole idea, the reason we all default to outside is because in our finite minds, we have this idea, <laughs> we're going to close that door. God can't see what we're doing here. Really? How's that working out for you? Maybe Rashi was on something. What do you got? I'm thinking when we think of those stories, though, we can only visualize the outside of the house. We don't know what the inside of someone's house looks like unless we've been there, just like God. You know, only God knows what the inside of our houses look like. Go further. But when we're looking at, like when we're looking at a storybook, and we, we have, that's how we visualize that story, is we see the blood on the outside because we can't see the inside of that person's heart. Only God can. Yep. Exactly right. You can't see the inside of that person's heart. How many times do we talk about being born again requires applying the blood of Yeshua to the doorpost of your heart? Inside or outside? Circumcise mm -hmm. your heart. And it's inside. It's a sign for who? All right. So we have three things going on here. It's going to be a sign for you. It's going to be a sign for them. 
And I submit that them could also have been them. The folks that were not Hebrews. Who would just like walk by and go, what's, John, what's that on your, what the, is that blood? What is that doing there? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's like a sign for, not only for the Israelites, but it's a sign for those who are outside. There was, in other words, there was something different going on there. Now we're going to look at, when he sees the blood, remember, we're going to spend some time looking at this about how the whole thing, finding symbols where they don't exist. I don't know why the Messianic community insists on this kind of thing. It's called sensationalism over soundness, or as I call it, gnats and camels. Well, straighter than that, swallow camel. Guilty. We're going to look at how quickly this can spiral into just bad teaching. We just get, sometimes we can just get stupid, and it all centers around the whole blood on the doorpost and the lintels. So you're about to get a quick Hebrew lesson. The door and the blood mysteriously represented Hebrew letter. This has been a common thing among Messianics for a long time. I'm going to make some folks unhappy. Okay, but we're going to dispel that idea right now with just solid information. Hebrew language lesson. Okay, Hebrew letters developed over time, just like our English did. And they came in three stages. There's the Canaanite, which we identify. There's some folks out there that I know would just they'd be jumping out down all happy and smiling because I'm, so, I'm going to talk about the Paleo. Uh, no, I'm not. But that's what we identify as the Paleo Hebrew, it was the Canaanite language. And then there was what's called the Kitav Ivri, it's a fancy schmancy term for Hebrew writing. That's what it means. Okay? And then there is the Kitav Ashuri, which is a fancy schmancy term for Assyrian writing. So what we have at this point is we have effectively four different versions of the Hebrew script. This, the Aleph, the Tav, and the Chet, this is modern-day Hebrew, this right here. The one behind that, that's the Assyrian Hebrew. The one behind that is the Kaptav Ivri, or the Hebrew script. And the last one down there is the Canaanite script. Now, kind of remember that as we move forward. I know that y'all are having a hard time seeing that. I wish I had a larger screen. Just kind of file those letters for a second, okay? So here's the deal. The top. There's a lot of folks out there that say, you know what? Now listen, that when they did that, that represented the letter Tav, which is the last letter in the Hebrew al alphabet. Okay? And they say it represented the Tav because the Tav represents the cross of Messiah. Okay. Now, that might work if you're talking about modern script. The problem was is that when the Israelites were in Egypt, they were using what we know as the Kitav Ivri. And you can't trace that on the door. This is the letter Tav in the Kitav Ivri. But this is how people got there because in the Paleo, it looks like a cross. Well, if it looks like a cross, then it must be the Tav that's on the door. Yeah, so that we can use the Tav and the people that have written books about how it, the Tav is on the door. No, it isn't. Stop. Just the Lord said to change our mind, not lose our mind. So the Tav just won't work. The next one is the Chet. Now, this one's even got a mathematical formula with it. Do y'all know what the Gematra is? It's a Hebrew numeric system. Uh, each, each word has a numeric equivalent because each Hebrew letter represents a, a, a number. Uh, in, in Hebrew, even today, there are, no numer there are no numerals in Hebrew. The Hebrew letters used to represent numbers. Okay, that's the short version of that. I don't spend too much time going down this road. The Chet is the eighth letter in the Hebrew alphabet. The eight, the number eight, stay with me, 
is supposed to be equal to the word chai, which means live, which represents chayim, which means life. The, the toast for chayim to life. Okay? It gets better. Stay with me. So therefore, John, therefore, okay, I've made my case, therefore, it had to be a hit on the door because Chet is the eighth letter, and eight equals high, which equals height. For life. For life. Or uh, compared to death. No, that won't work either. Because again, this is modern Hebrew or the Hebrew Assyrian. The Hebrew that they would have used at that time would have looked like this. Hmm. You can't trace that on a door, it's not going to work. If you go back to the Paleo Hebrew, it looks like that. That's not going to work either. Matter of fact, you can't even get in a door like that. So that one won't work. And then there's this last one oh, called the three points teaching. That's just stay with me. It'll be over soon. And the premise is this. Okay, they had, there were just three points on the doorpost and the nose. They just, they were just told to strike it, and that was it. But, but Diane, if you take that door and you turn it upside down, then you end up with the same marks that you had on the cross. Well, you'll take a breath for a minute. No, no, that's no good either. That's 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 gnats and camels. That's finding things where they just don't exist. We don't need a literal sign. We don't. Like we said earlier, what the Word of God says is powerful enough. It does not need any help. The blood of the sacrifice was the sign, the oat. It was the blood itself that they saw. It was the monument or the token of the covenant that they had. And that was their token that the coming redemption from Egypt was going to take place. The blood of Messiah is our token that we have been redeemed from our own personal Egypt. That's all the sign we need. What did Yeshua say when they started asking him for signs? What's the sign of who you are? And he said, you're not going to get nothing. Except for looking back at John. That was the only sign they were going to see. And they had to work it through for themselves. It was decision time for the Israelites at this point. The angel of death was coming for everybody. It didn't matter. They had to make up their mind. And those who applied the blood made a conscious decision to go with Adonai regardless of the cost. I'll say that again. The, those who applied the blood, those of us who apply the blood of Messiah are making a conscious decision to go with God no matter the cost. If we haven't made that decision, then we have not applied the blood. It's just kind of the way it goes. If there are conditions to our commitment to him, then we're not committed to him. If there were conditions to my commitment to that one that was over there by the table while ago, then I'm not committed to it. Simple. <laughs> Applying the blood marked them. But now we come to inside or outside. It didn't yeah, it didn't matter. They were still marked because they were busy with the with the lamb and with the hyssop and painting, whether it was inside the door or outside the door. They were busy painting. Okay. And people knew. And they were marked. It marks us too. We must be marked also. And so the question is asked: Are you marked? Are you marked? To the point that people see that you're marked. It will make you stand out if you're truly marked because I'm gonna let's just step out a little bit because we don't have much time to step out a lot because we got a late start. If you're truly marked, the way you live your life will indicate that you're marked. You just won't operate the way everybody else, as Mike pointed out. We step out of here, we're going back out into the world. When I read scripture, and this, that's the meaning I give. I get a lot of it out. Egypt is the world. Yep. And if we walk out there and live like they live, then we're not really marked because we haven't changed. If we're staying out there with them and living like they live just to get along and stop rocking the boat, we need to rethink that. We've got to be set apart. We've got to be set apart. Sanctified. That's the Hebrew word. Kodesh. 
set apart. If you are truly marked, you also have that supernatural hope. That's, that's why it's okay to be different from the world. Because we have that supernatural hope that one of these days, he's coming back to get us. If he didn't come back to get me before I leave this earth, that's okay too. Because I know where I will spend eternity. If I make it there before you, I'll see you see. Micah 7 and verse 8. Boy, this is one to write down. You should not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will stand up. When I sit in darkness, Yahweh will be a light for me. When we face hard times, we need to remember this verse. Because it's the adversary is trying to get us to fall. Micah 7 and verse 8. Remember, Paul made this very clear. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood. Even if it's somebody that just makes you mad enough to beat this pony. It's not that person. Ultimately, it's the adversary poking at you to see if they can find a, way, a, a weak spot and get to you. When that starts happening, don't rejoice over me if I fall. I'm telling the devil that. Don't rejoice over me because I'm getting back up. Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And then if this one's not enough, Messiah himself said in John 12 and verse 46, I have come as a light into the world. In order that most folks, you know, it says everyone, everyone who believes in me will not remain in the darkness. We're supposed to carry the light with us wherever we go. All right, so we're finally here. Everybody go. I didn't think we were going to make it. Takeaways and final thoughts. This is, we'll wrap it all up here. We must be the light in the darkness. We, us, them, you, you, are the only light some people will see. So what light are they looking at? Are they looking at almost light? Or are they looking at really light? Remember what we said way back when God drew that line? There was darkness in Egypt, but there was light in Goshen. Just because they had light didn't mean it was easy. Just because we have light doesn't mean it's easy, but we're still expected to share that light wherever we go. I've got to share it with her so she can share it with me, so we can share it with you. That's, that's the way the thing works. We need each other, whether y'all know it or not. And we're going to need each other a lot more. Yes. I need you, John. We need that sharpening that takes place. I need Brad and Gidget. Just met y'all. I need y'all too. Because you're part of a community. Yeah. You don't know it yet, but you might as well settle in because you're part of a community as of today. <laughs> Nobody said this would be easy like we said earlier, okay? Y'all have heard me say this. I'm, it bears repeating again because I don't hear it. Anybody tells you that walking the Christian walk is easy, run from them. Run as hard as your little feet will carry you, run from them. Because they're wrong. Because as my bride keeps reminding me sometimes, because I need it, Messiah himself reminded us that we will, in this life, we will face persecution and affliction. We will. And if you're not being persecuted or afflicted, sorry. You need to step up your game. Maybe, yeah, that's right. You need to step up your game. <laughs> if the adversary is leaving you alone, that means you're not a threat. We will reflect what we really believe. This is good. You might not like this, but this is really good. Y'all write that down. We will reflect what we really believe. If I really believe that Yeshua is the Messiah of the world and he died for me and that I am redeemed as of this moment. If I really believe that, my life should reflect that. I should be that changed person. Is the blood applied inside for you or outside for others? I submit it should be applied in both places. Because applying it outside I'll make sure that I live in such a manner that Gidget, whether she knew me or not, would go. That man's got something going on that I don't understand. There should be a light there that you should see. 
Brad and I had a chance to share light with each other Thursday morning. I mean, that's just the way that, that works. When we get together, there's a greater light going on than there was with just me. There has to be blood applied both inside and outside. Inside right. makes the change. It's not our light. That's exactly right. Like that. Say that again. It's not our light. It's his light reflecting off of us. Moon and sun. Moon and sun. Absolutely. The moon reflects the light of the sun. Yeah. I'm sorry. The moon has no light of the sun. I'm sorry. We've got to go there. And if something gets in the way of the moon, then it can't reflect all the sun it's supposed to reflect. If something gets in the way of our moon, Egypt gets in the way. What? <laughs> Remember what we said earlier? Diane was sitting there doing this when we were talking about it. Hard heartedness, there's no upside to it. <clears throat> if being hard hearted gets in my way, then I'm not reflecting everything I'm supposed to reflect. Stop looking for signs, please. Quit, just quit looking for signs. We in the Messianic community, and if you all stick around, you'll find out that there's just there's some. Would you call it camels and what? Gnats and camels. <laughs> yep, gnats and camels. Within the Messianic community, there are lovely people, but there are also some wackadoodles. Y'all stop looking for signs. Just like all of us. Just like all of us. That's right. All the signs we need are in the Word. As Paul said to Timothy, study to show yourself approved. Stay in the Word. Dare to believe that Adonai, that God's Word is true. Not only that, that it's true for you. See, it's easy for me to go, yeah, God's Word's true. I, I believe God's going to heal Mike. I don't think he'll heal me. I know he's going to heal Mike. Right? And it's not, and his word's not true for me. But that's the way I feel. And it can't just be true for me later. It's got to be true for me right now. Right now. It's got to be true for me. So we need to dare, dare to believe that God's word is true for you right now, not later. And then take away some final thoughts from last time. If you didn't get a chance to see it, Go back and look at the video. Remember, walking as a favorite child can be difficult. Strength is found in the waiting period. Y'all know, y'all that were here, Jenna, y'all know where we're going with this. Courage has to be decided on. The people of Israel had to decide that they were going to put the blood on their doorpost. Whether it was inside or outside, people would know, and they had to make that decision. Remember this? If you intend to fully live, chayah, the Hebrew word for life, if you intend to fully live, you must be strong, chazak, and exercise courage, amat, while you wait, kaveh. Remember, the Hebrew word for wait is not sitting in a chair. The Hebrew word for wait is wait. Because something's about to happen, and I'm going to be ready, dying when it happens. I'm going. That's waiting. That's biblical waiting. Waiting in anticipation for something to happen. We're not in this to be popular or to get along. We're in this to make a difference. There are people out there who don't know what we know. Jenna, there are people out there who don't know what you know. <laughs> and they need what we know. They don't even realize that they do. But they need what we know. And me picking up my 97-pound Schofield reference Bible and hollering, repent, is not going to share with them what they need to know. I have to be light in the darkness. I have to show them that there's a difference, that there's another way, that there's a better way. Psalm 27 and verse 14. This, for you too, this is part of last. our last teaching was Psalm 27 and 14. You may want to go out and jump out to YouTube and find that video. We broke this verse down. It says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. So wait on Adonai. Remember the Hebrew. Kavei el Adonai, chazak, vayametz, lebecha, your heart. 
Vakave el Adonai. What I say to you, wait on Adonai. Kave el Adonai Chazak via Ametz Yabeka. There it is in large letters. It's wait on Adonai. Be strong, Chazak. Be strong. Via Ametz. That's the part to remember. And he will strengthen. He will. You don't have to gin up strength. You don't have to gin up strength through your heart. You've got a promise that if you just be courageous, stand, he will strengthen your heart. And those of you that know, if you've interacted at all with folks who've seen the wolf at the door that have dealt in combat, a man who has courage in his heart, or a woman, cannot be stopped. They won't lie down for anything. They won't stop. There's no, there's no quit in them. Once that courage appears in their heart, there's no quit in them. There's not supposed to be any quit in us either. And finally, 1 Peter 5, 8 through 11, y'all know this. Stay alert. Watch out. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, searching for someone to devour. Stand up against him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being laid upon your brothers and sisters throughout the world. We're not in this by ourselves. There's other folks that are dealing with worse things than we're dealing with. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you into his eternal glory in Messiah, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. Write those verses down, find them in your Bible, circle them, highlight them, find the new translation, read them, memorize them. After you've struggled a little bit, it is God himself who will restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. I challenge you to look up the Greek on that verse. All power to him forever. Amen. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Let's pray. Father. We bless you, Magnify. We thank you for what we've learned, for what we've talked about. Thank you for the, the sharpening that's taken place here and for the beauty of, of discussion. Father, we just ask that you will take what we have heard here, that those seeds were planted in fertile ground, that those seeds will spring up, that they'll become a bush and then a tree and then a fruitful tree full of fruit for the king. Help us to be courageous. Remind us, Father, that we wait on you, and it is you who will strengthen our hearts. We love you. We magnify you, sir. We bless you. I lay these petitions before you in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. And if y'all will stand, we will do as the scriptures claim. God told Aaron, he said this, is how you will place my name on the people. I'm not Aaron, but I'm standing in his stead at this moment, so please allow me to place the name of Adonai on the people. <laughs> Yesa ha Yahweh panavaleka v'yasem leka shalom. Now may Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua our Messiah. Amen. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Can we say, Hazek, Hazek? Hazek, we can say that, yeah. even Hazek. though we've already finished the book. We can say that. Hazek, Hazek, Bani Hazek. Let us be strong. Be strong, be strong, and let, and us, let us be strengthened. strengthened especially in these times that we're in. Shabbat shalom, Shabbat shalom, everybody. Join us next time, February. Second. I don't know. It's either going to be the first Wherever. and the third Saturday of February we'll you know. or the second and the fourth. We'll let you know. We'll let you know. We'll, we'll send you the invitation. We'll let you know. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.